All right, and I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Brad, if you would be kind enough to uh, keep an eye on the waiting room there and let everybody in. Thank you so much. You got it. I love it. Thank you. We are here today to talk about Borrow It. If we haven't met yet, I'm Maria Bernier, the State Data Coordinator, and I'm here with my supervisor, Don. <laughs> Don is here. Um, thanks so much for being here, Don. We wanted to start today by getting everybody back into the boat with regard to Borrow It CT and the regulations, um, what you're loaning and who you're loaning it to. So this is our refresher today. I am recording, as I mentioned, so that recording will be available to you if you'd like to go back and listen to anything again. I have the slides online. You should have received an email confirmation yesterday with a reminder about today's session, including a link to where you can find the slides online. And those are the ones we're looking at right now. So we're gonna spend some time with um, the slides and then we'll take a look at our LibGuide. So, here we go. I would love to start with a little bit of context about this program because it has been around for almost 50 years. So there's a lot of history going on here. And it was actually the brainchild of a group, I think, called Connecticut 72. That was a, a task force of librarians brainstorming about what they wanted Connecticut libraries to look like in 1976. So borrow it what they called Kineticard, um, was a reciprocal borrowing program that they came up with. And it really got its foundation in 1973 with a public act, which is a law. So this is a statute in the state of Connecticut. And those statutes were revised a little bit later in 1982 and 1984, but we are currently operating the Borrow It program under those public acts from 1984. So that law sort of sets the overarching tone and then the rules are further elucidated in the regulations for Connecticut state agencies. So we'll take a look at those. But in 1973, they had this idea. They started getting libraries to cooperate, to sign on. And by December of 1973, they started launching publicity to the general public about this great reciprocal borrowing and sharing program. And finally, right at the beginning of January 1974, it officially began. There were 143 libraries participating at that point, which is approximately three quarters of the public libraries in Connecticut. So that was a really strong response back in the 70s from libraries who saw the great potential of this program. And of course, once they started lending, then uh, the library started getting reimbursements for those loans. And those first reimbursements were issued in June, 1974. So imagine back then they didn't have spreadsheets, they didn't have email, they didn't have snazzy little online forms. The libraries actually mailed back postcards and some poor soul had to sit in an office and tabulate all of these numbers by hand to figure out their reimbursement. So we have come a long way since 1974. And you'll see right there in the very first year, they made almost 400,000 loans, which I find remarkable that back then so many people were really interested in um, reading and in using library services. And they made a great impact even in that very first year. And of course, once you start loaning 400,000 items to people who don't live in your town, you've got to figure out how to get them back to the library. And initially it was a kind of a combination of people bringing items directly back to the library, mailing them back, sort of transporting them back. But this other brainchild of the task force was the Connecticut delivery service to make sure that all those items got back to their home libraries um, expeditiously. So that service started a year after Connecticut did and supported it, and they have gone in tandem ever since. But I want to point out that by December 1981, there were 179 libraries participating. So more libraries joined on as they saw the success of the program. Then as we kind of flash forward to 1989, that was the year that the 27 millionth item was transacted. And oddly enough, 1989 was the year of the library in Connecticut and there were special ceremonies, but somebody had calculated 
that on that date, roughly in 1989, they would have processed that many kinetic card transactions, which is remarkable over that period of time. Um, so what is that? Maybe 15, 16 years or so. That's a lot of items changing hands. So in that year, 191 libraries partic were participating, which is most of our public libraries. And then by January of 94, the regulations were updated. So those, are, as I mentioned, are the rules for how Kinetic Card and Borrow It works. We're still operating under those regulations from 1994. So remember, think about what libraries were like back then. We weren't really doing the internet, right? So we might have had maybe some kind of computerized lending system. We weren't providing online public access computers in the way we are. Uh, we weren't lending eBooks and downloadable audios because those weren't a thing. We were lending physical items, books, magazines, books on audio cassette, um, VHS tapes. So we were loaning physical things. And that's how the regulations are written, basically thinking about libraries in 1994. So jumping ahead to 2010, that was the year in which the most loans were made, almost 5 million. That was kind of the peak of the service. Since then, in about um, the years prior to COVID, we've been um, loaning about 3.5 million items. So the number has come down a little bit. Um, and then this most recent year, we're loaning a little bit over 2 million items. So there's been a, an adjustment with COVID. Also pointing out in 2015, the service was renamed as Borrow at Connecticut, Borrow at CT. That was when we rebranded all of our statewide library services. So I know you guys are still calling it C card and Connecticut card. I'm going to keep calling it Borrow it. So um, that's the terminology I'm going to be using, but it sounds like we're talking about the same thing. And then to point out right here, cumulatively, since this program has been in effect, there have been 154 million loans made to non-residents. So think about that impact. Think about all of the people who are reading and listening and watching things um, that they didn't necessarily have in their own public library. So that's a really remarkable impact over the past almost 50 years of this service. Very cool stuff. I'd like to point out Target 76, Dawn, thank you. I just looked in the chat. That was the name of the task force, Target 76, um, that had all these great brainchilds. I would like to point out, if you have questions as I go along, please put them in the chat. I'm gonna catch those at the end and make sure that I address all of them. But as you're thinking about your questions, go ahead and, and write them in the chat there and I'll make sure that I catch them. So now we're heading into the rules and these are from the regulations of Connecticut state agencies. And if you're really interested, you can click over and read them. I also have these on our LibGuide so you can read them all, but that's, that's the citation there. So good rules always start with definitions. And I like to cover the definitions to make sure that we're all on the same page. So Connecticut Card, the program, in summary, allows a resident of any town in the state, so let's break that down, right? So any resident of Connecticut in any town who holds a valid borrower card, and we're gonna talk about what a valid borrower card means that's issued by their home library. And of course, home library has a definition as well, can use that card to borrow materials from any participating public library in the state. So what that means is if I live in one town and I've got a borrower card from my library, I can go to the next town or a town across the state and borrow materials from that library. If anything that's sitting on the shelf, I can walk in and borrow. That is the philosophy of Kinetic Card of the Borrow It program. So let's look at the definition. What do we mean by resident? Okay, you're a resident of a town if you are principally domiciled in that town. And even in 1973, they planned ahead for Connecticut residents who may have multiple pieces of property. And they said, if you've got dual residency or you own property in, in multiple towns, then you're a resident only in the town in which you're principally domiciled. So let's apply that if somebody, owns a home in Fairfield County, and they have a weekend home in Litchfield County. 
their principal domicile will be in Fairfield County, and that will be their home library. And by extension, if they are not principally domiciled in Litchfield County, they're not a resident, technically for the purposes of the Borrow It program. So think about where your patrons are coming from, where they're living, whether they are officially primarily domiciled in your town, or if they are principally domiciled somewhere else. So apply that appropriately in your context. Let's look at the definition of a home library. It's the public library in the town where the borrower is a resident. So if my principal domicile is in Fairfield County, that's my home library. And there's an official definition of a Connecticut, Connecticut card borrower card issued by the home library. So the only card that you can use to borrow through the Connecticut card program is from your home library. That's why these distinctions are important. So that's what we're talking about today. So we're gonna talk about requirements. All parties here have some requirements. So your library has some things you need to do. The patrons have some things that they need to do. And the state library has some obligations in this process as well. So let's talk about what the library requirements are. So first off, to be valid, you need to issue borrower cards that have all three pieces of information on them. So the name and town of your library, and if you are a memorial library named after a person, you'll want to make sure that your town is included somewhere in your library logo or somewhere on the card there so people know where that town is. You'll also need to put the patron's name on the card. So maybe they've handwritten it, maybe you handwrite it, maybe you print it on a label. However that works, their name needs to be present on the card. And the third piece is that there needs to be a specific future expiration date on the card. So what this means is your library first off needs to have expiration dates. And I know that most of you do because you tell me in your annual report that your cards expire after two years or three years or five years. So make sure that all of your staff are aware of expiration dates so that when a new patron comes in to get a new card and you're putting the expiration date on there that it fits what your policies are. So you'll write that on there in some way. Maybe it's a sticker that you put on that you update each time they renew their card in some way. All of those pieces of information need to be on the card so that when the patron presents that card at another library, that library has a very clear understanding of who they are, what their home library is, and that their card is still active and valid. So those are the three pieces of information. And of course, under the Borrow It statutes, that first card has to be issued free. Can't charge for the first card, but you can charge for replacement cards if somebody loses a card and just needs a copy, needs a new card. You can charge for that. Another requirement under the Borrow It rules is that your library must lend to residents all physical materials that you loan to residents. And physical is in parentheses there because it's not explicitly stated in the regulations from 1994 because de facto in 94, everything that we loaned was physical. We didn't loan any kind of eBooks or downloadables. So by default, all physical items that you loan to your residents, you have to lend to your residents. And this applies to everything regardless of how it's funded. So even if you are using money from your friends donations, from an endowment fund with a restricted use, from a grant, regardless of how you paid for those items, you do need to lend them to non-residents. And this includes everything, right? So it's hotspots, museum passes, laptops, ukuleles, cake pans, power equipment, um, what else, whatever else you're lending, jigsaw puzzles, anything that's physical that you are lending to your residents, you need to lend to your non-residents. And you also, that next bullet point, need to use the same circulation and renewal rules for everybody. So if your policy is that an item circulates for two weeks, and it can be renewed once, that policy has to be applied to everybody equally, regardless of whether they're residents or non-residents. And just in case, 
um, a resident, a non-resident can ask you for a copy of your circulation policy and procedures. So one super easy way to do that, just have your policies and procedures on your website so staff can pull it up and print that information for people. I suspect that doesn't happen too often, um, but if somebody asks for it, you do need to give them a copy of your policy. So more library requirements, you do need to tell us how many items you loan. So you're gonna file a report of your lending each year. Um, and usually that happens in the first two weeks of March by March 15th, using the form that we supply you. That form right now is an Excel spreadsheet and you just fill in the number of loans you make to patrons from other libraries each month. And you sort of gather that along every month and then you send it to me at the beginning of March and I collate all of those. You will also now need to certify the accuracy of the report. That's written into the state regulations that you have to certify the accuracy. And you also need to file an expenditure report each year. And that's just a report, pretty simple and straightforward of how you spent the money that you received for your reimbursement. So those are your requirements. There are some optional things. So these are not requirements, but they are mentioned in the state regulations. So I wanted to talk about them today. You may, but look at that bold. You are not required to accept reserves and ILL requests from non-residents under the same rules and policies that you apply to your residents. So if you want to, you can accept reserves and ILLs from non-residents but you are not required to do that. And I spelled it out in that second bullet point because somebody's gonna ask me, I know, and somebody's gonna ask you once they hear you've attended this webinar. Yes, so you can let your residents reserve or place holds on materials in advance without letting non-residents do the same. That is perfectly legal under the borrow it regulations. And we'll see an example of what that looks like as we go along. Some more optional things. And this really relates to how you um, kind of integrate non-residents into your ILS or how you give them a new card. You've got a couple options. If a non-resident comes in and wants to borrow items, you can give them a local use only card. Totally okay, right? You got your own little card, your own barcode. Obviously that card has to be free under the regulations, but those cards are going to say for use in this library only. You're going to write it on there. It's going to have their name and their town of residence on there. So that may be an option, for instance, if you've got school teachers who teach in town and maybe live somewhere else. What a great service to offer your school teachers, right? Say, hey, come on in, you guys. Let us give you a local use only card. You can borrow books all you want from our children's room, from our YA, from our adult section. Come on in, school teachers will give you one of these cards. That may be how you wanna handle it, totally up to you. Another option is you may just go ahead and scan the patron's home library card into your ILS. That's an option too, right? You create a new patron record for that person in your ILS. And instead of scanning your own barcode, you're gonna go ahead and scan their barcode. So that puts them into your system and makes it a little bit more seamless. However you wanna handle it is up to you under the regulations. Some more optional things. Your library can require that non-print materials be returned directly to your library. So for instance, if you're loaning out hotspots, if you're loaning out um, jigsaw puzzles, if you're loaning out a shovel, you can say to somebody as they're checking out that item, you do have to bring it back to our library. You can't just bring it back to any library, you gotta bring it back here. You can say that. And you can also require that those materials come back into the circulation desk and not into the book drop. Just let people know if that's your circulation policy as you're checking it out to them. Um, and we specifically talk about non-print materials here because it's written right into the borrow it regulations that print materials can be returned to any participating public library. It's just the non-print materials that you can put some extra regulations on, some extra rules for your own policy. Okay, so let's look at what your patrons have to do to participate in this system. 
they've got to bring you a valid Connecticut library card. Well, kind of obviously, right? Like if they want to walk into your library and borrow something, they've got to bring you a library card. Great. Now it actually has to be their card. It can't be somebody coming in and saying, oh, my dad said I could use his card to borrow stuff at your library. Okay, maybe your dad did, but as a, the library in the next town over, you really need to see that um, it comes from somebody to whom it was issued. And this is written right into the state regulations that the card has to be used by the person to whom it was issued. Now you can also ask patrons to provide up to two different forms of identification to show that they are the person to whom the card was issued. That is within your purview. It's written again right there in the regulations um, that you can request up to two forms of ID. Often a state photo ID will serve your purposes, whether it's a driver's license or something else issued by the state, but you can request an additional form as well. And obviously the borrower is responsible for the, anything that they have checked out from your library. So they're responsible for returning those items. They are responsible for any overdue fees that they incur while uh, keeping those items out. And if they lose anything, they're responsible for paying it back to you. That's their job. Okay, and then requirements from the state library. We've got a job in this too, and it's primarily the reports. Obviously, if there's paperwork to be done, we've got to do it. So we're going to put some reports together every single year, including borrow at use at each library. And I do that based on the reports that you send me. We also provide a list of participating libraries and a summary of the expenditure reports. And all of that information is on our LibGuide, which I'm gonna show you a little bit later as we go through the presentation. So you'll see where all of that is. And we also issue the payments to each library that participates. So that's our job. Let's talk about the money while we're here. Um, each year, each biennial budget, the legislature sets aside some money for this program to support it. And it's really a reimbursement payment. Um, so that each library that participates in loans items gets a little reimbursement of a few cents per item that they've loaned out. And in general, half of the available funds reimburses all the loans. So everybody who loaned an item gets a little bit of money. And the other half of the available funds goes to reimburse net loans. So there are some cases where libraries lend more to non-residents, then their own residents borrow at other libraries. That's a net lender, right? So the libraries that are incredibly generous with their collections and lending to lots of non-residents, they tend to get a few pennies for those net loans as well. Those payments under the state regulations and in state law must be used for your general library purposes and cannot revert to the municipality's general fund. So you guys have a major leg to stand on there. It's in state law. The money has to come back to you at the library for offering those services. So make sure your town is aware of that. Another general rule I wanted to say right here in writing, so it's part of the presentation that you print off and you share with your coworkers. As I mentioned, those print materials can be returned to any participating public library which is gonna send them through deliver it to their home library. That's in the state laws as well. I also like to draw the difference between borrow it and interlibrary loan, because they're not the same thing. And so when you report your interlibrary loans in your annual report, make sure you're not including borrow it. And likewise, when you send me your borrow it report, make sure you're not including interlibrary loans. So just taking a look under borrow it, what does that mean? That means you're lending items to a specific person. Um, that person who is a non-resident of your town is walking into your library, borrowing items that are sitting on your shelves. You're lending items specifically to a person. And that individual borrower is assuming responsibility for the material. Remember how I said, they're gonna to have to bring it back. They've gotta pay you overdue fines. They've gotta pay if they lose it. And those materials, those print materials can be returned to any participating public library. Now in contrast, an interlibrary loan 
is a loan from one library to another. That's what interlibrary means, right? Between libraries. And the borrowing library in this case assumes responsibility for the material because they are actually borrowing it on behalf of a patron. And in this case, ILLs, um, the material really needs to be brought back to the library that initiated the loan. So if your library requests a book on behalf of a patron and you check it out to a patron, your patron really should bring it back to you so you can check it off and make sure it gets sent back to the right place. So that's really the difference between borrow it and ILL. Okay, let's talk about some clarifications because remember how I said the regulations were written in 1994? They are a little bit old rules and sometimes new situations come up, right? Technology changes, people come up with new ideas. So let's talk about some clarifications that have been issued subsequently to 1994. These rules do not apply to electronic content. E-materials are um, licensed specifically to a library or to a consortium for use by those patrons. So under the bar regulations, you are not required to loan e-materials to non-residents. That's pretty unequivocal right there. You don't have to lend your downloadables, your e-books to anybody who doesn't live in town. So, um, that's okay, it, it's, that's how it is. We're not gonna hold you to it. But if you lend ebook readers, so if you're lending Kindles or Nooks or tablets or something else that contains electronic materials, you must lend those to non-residents in addition to residents under the same conditions because those ebook readers are physical items. So that's how electronic content works. And we can also talk about multiple cards for kids. Sometimes kids live in two households or more, um, and it's okay for them to have two home libraries because they're kids, right? And what they have no control. Uh, they get shipped around from place to place and carted and transported, and they don't often have a lot of um, say in the matter. So it is okay to issue cards to kids at their multiple homes. Um, often the caregiver in one home does not wanna be responsible for what the other caregiver has done at the other library. So uh, give the kid another card. It's totally okay, right? Like who wouldn't want to have multiple library cards as a kid and to have multiple libraries um, where they could access all the materials that they wanted at their heart's content. So. Um, in the spirit of giving and openness to kids and literacy, go ahead and give those kids some multiple cards as long as their caregivers, guardians, or parents are willing to accept that responsibility. That's okay under borrow it. Keychain cards, I think, were also not a thing in 1994, but they've come along since then. And they're tiny, right? And there's not always space to put all of the information that you need to put on there about the issuing library name and town and the patron name and the expiration date. So if somebody comes to your library as a non-resident and presents their keychain card and says, I'd like to borrow some items, go ahead and record information about them. So whether it's in your ILS or in some other system you're keeping, make sure that you're getting information about their issuing library in town, their name, and their expiration date, so you've captured that, so that subsequently when they come back, you don't need to recapture that information. You can just look it up again, and all you really need to do is double check that they are who they say they are and who the card belongs to. So I'd like to show you some kind of correct procedures just so you've got some examples to to follow because we're libraries, right? We like to rip off and duplicate. We like to see what other policies are so that we can get some ideas and adapt them for our own purposes. These actually are links. So once you pull up the slides on your own computer, you can pop over and see what these look like on those libraries' websites. But you'll see Otis Library in Norwich just says right flat out on their circulation page, if you've got a current library card from another Connecticut town, you can use it to borrow items here. That is the spirit of this program. Borrow It is all about that, right? If you've got a card from your library, come on over, we'll lend you stuff. Right on out there. That's a great way to say it. And Waterford with regard to their hotspots is right out there as well. 
You can have them for two weeks and they can be borrowed by all Connecticut Library card holders. Come on down, we got hot spots for you. So those are some really lovely open examples that are completely compliant with borrow it regulations. And here's a great example from Wallingford about reservations. They very specifically clarified this procedure with us to make sure that they were adhering to the rules. And remember how we said, if you want to, you can let non-residents hold items or reserve items, but you don't have to. And so Wallingford said, you know what? We're gonna let residents reserve things up to 30 days in advance either by contacting the library or using their online reservation system. And that sort of validates against the barcode. But then they say right out there, non-residents may borrow items from our non-traditional collection if the items are available at the time of pickup. Absolutely compliant with borrow it. Online reservations are not available to non-residents. But that's okay because what the borrow it program is about is people coming into your library, borrowing items that are on the shelf, um, with their non-resident card. So this is all a correct procedure and one that you could emulate at your library. So a couple of things that you should really avoid in your procedures. And the first is saying that you lend items only to your card holders. So think about that. How are non-residents gonna get a card at your library? What does that mean? Typically when I see on a website that you lend items only to your card holders, that sounds to me like you're lending them only to your residents. And you don't wanna give people that impression, right? Because that's not compliant with the borrow at regulations. You really want to say, um, we lend these items to anybody with a valid Connecticut Public Library card. That's the great way to do it. You would also wanna avoid saying that a card must be in good standing or having fines less than a certain dollar amount because that becomes impractical to check on somebody else's library card, right? If you're trying to call a library to check on their borrower's card and that library is not open right now, but there's somebody standing right in front of you who just wants to borrow that book so they can go home and do their report, just let them borrow the book, right? So, so again, remove the barriers. Let's take away those barriers about good standing and fines and say, all you need is a valid Connecticut public library card and we will lend you these items. So that's really the ethos you wanna follow. Let's talk about our report form. So you can take a look at that. Um, hopefully you can see this. I made up Nutmeg Public Library. And this is what their form is going to look like when they send it to me in March. So here's a little nutmeg right, right here in this line. They happen to be in the eastern part of Connecticut. And so there are some patrons from Norwich who pop over every month and borrow items. So they have noted those lines in the Norwich um, line here. So each month they say we lent this many items to patrons who are originally from Norwich. And occasionally they get visitors from Old Lyme and Old Saybrook who borrow items, and they have made note of those loans in the form as well. Obviously, they're on the eastern side of the state, and nobody from Norwalk and Orange and Oxford is going to drive all the way over there. So they haven't made any borrow it loans to patrons from those libraries, so those lines are blank. <laughs> And no, Nutmeg's line is blank. You always want to make sure that your library's line is blank because you're not counting the loans you make to your own patrons. You're counting the loans you make to patrons at other libraries. And here's what the bottom of the form looks like. So the monthly totals will add up, add up automatically. That's set up in the form. You may have more totals than this. And this part at the bottom is new. So this really comes from our annual report form. It may look familiar to those of you who fill out that annual re report where we're asking about your contact information for the person who filled out the form, name, title, date, library name. And then there's a new question about whether you certify that the library director has seen this report in its entirety and has confirmed that the information in the report is accurate and complete to the best of their knowledge. That's a yes, no response. And that language is also copied from our annual report. 
So you do want to certify and say, yes, my library director has seen this information. They confirm that this information is accurate and complete to the best of their knowledge. I need to see a yes when you send me this back. The second question, do you certify that your library adheres to all requirements of the Borrow at CT program? And it spells out some of those requirements, including lending to non-residents all the same physical materials under the same terms that you lend to your residents. So what we're talking about today, that you're complying with those regulations, and also that you issue borrower cards that include the name and town of your library, the name of the patron, as well as that specific future expiration date. So you do need to do those things. And you're not charging a fee for borrower cards or issuing such cards. You can charge a fee for the replacement card, but not for the initial card. So this answer also needs to be a yes. If any of these answers are no, you don't get your borrow at reimbursement payment. So you guys make sure that you're certifying these things and that you are in compliance with the regulations of borrow it, and then we'll get to your money. That's the way to go. So just some reminders about the report form rules. You will send it to me in the first couple of weeks of March each year. You'll certify it at the bottom. And remember, you're sending me your borrow it loans, not counting any interlibrary loans on that form. If you belong to a consortium, my goodness, you should get them to help you with this form. There should be some kind of report you can run in your ILS that gives you these numbers each month. Um, that's what you pay them for. They should really be helping you with this as you fill out your form. Um, let's take a look over at our LibGuide. If you need to find it, this link will work for you on the slides. I'm gonna hop over there right now. This is what the homepage looks like. If I stretch it out here a little bit more. And if you need to find it, if you don't have a handy link, which you may not, you can always take a look at our top menu on all of our LibGuides. This menu appears on every single guide and borrow it is under services. Services is all of our key statewide services, borrow it, deliver it, ego, all of those great things in alphabetical order with children's right there. So borrow it is right here at the top in order. If for some reason you're stuck on a page and you can't find us any other way, you can use the search box which also appears at the top of every single page. And you can find us that way. And if you're ever on just on the DLD homepage here, you can find us in the link cloud right here. It's the very first link right up here under the programs and services. Super easy to get here to borrow it. Now in our LibGuides, there are these multiple tabs and each tab is another separate sort of page or information layer all about borrow it. So you'll wanna make sure you dig into those. And within each box, there can be additional tabs here. So make sure that you're looking at everything and really reading through it. This first page is kind of an overview about the program, summarizing things that we've talked about today, giving you more links to deeper pages within here. A Little bit about eligibility, if you're interested in that. I do, in fact, have a signed letter of agreement on file from every single library. I just looked at these last week. It's a big three ring binder and I double checked everybody's in there. I got a letter um, probably from 1973 or 74, maybe from the early 80s, but I do have documentation from every library that they agree to participate and borrow it. Um, and there's also this information about eligibility. There's info here about the grant payments, the reimbursements that we make to your library and how that works. And if you need a reminder about dates, that's right here as well. But let me scroll up a little bit and go through each of these pages too, because this impact page is pretty cool. We put this together for the state legislature to take a look at. Uh, periodically they say, ah, you don't need all that money. You know, that's a big line item, let's cut that. But in fact, it's hugely influential. Uh, this $700,000 supports an amazing amount of resource sharing. And if libraries had to purchase all the items that they loaned um, or that their patrons borrowed from other libraries, they would be spending $52 million. So it's incredibly um, impactful. It's got a great return on investment. This is one of the most wonderful things about Connecticut that 
anybody can walk into any participating public library, show their card and borrow items. It's really, really cool. So this is about the impact of the program. I encourage you to dig in there a little bit. If you ever need to find the report form, it's right here, report form. You can click on that funny little picture right there if you wanna download it, but it's right here as an Excel form, you'll just download and open it. And this includes the certifications in there. Also right here is the regulations. So if you ever wanna read all of the regulations, they are right here, you can read them. Here's our slides. I'm in fact using these slides right now to show you. So that's what we looked at. Our recording will be on our YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow. I'm not sure I'll get it up this afternoon, It'll, but it will be there tomorrow if you wanna take a look. And here's, um, if you wanna see the state's website about the regulations, you can check there. Here's a handy printable version of it if you want, but they're all here, keyword searchable right there. All the rules. And there's some clarification statements if you wanna take a look at that about e-resources. The statistics page is actually pretty cool too, and I'm a numbers dork, so I can say that, but all the charts are here. If you're curious about what your payment was or what other libraries got, that information is here. This report creator is actually really neat. Um, you can customize it for your library. You can see how many items your library borrows or loans each year. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's really informative just to see, um, are you a net lender, net borrower? <coughs> Excuse me, how that works. You can also see your payments, um, what you have been reimbursed for the past several years and see the financial impact of this in your bottom line. That's available there. Net plus loans, which libraries are making more loans. <coughs> and then if you wanna look at them kind of on the internet instead of in an Excel file, that's there as well. This expenditure report form right here is a pretty simple survey monkey form it's maybe four questions asking you how you spent that money from last year and each library does need to fill out this form by the end of october i think i might have about 45 reports so that still leaves me 130 so libraries that need to submit their expenditure report form for this year so that's where you would find the link which i'm going to send you all by email again at some point in october so don't worry about that um, but all the info is here. So, so as I mentioned earlier, the state library has some reporting obligations. So here's where you're going to start finding the reports um, right down here, the expenditure report summary and these payment reports right here. So that's our side of things. Okay, I'm going to put this on the impact slide for a minute so you guys can read that while I review all of the chat. Wow. You guys were really prolific in the chat. I appreciate that. I'm gonna start at the top. Kate, your question is specific date. This must include day, not just month and year. I would recommend that you put a specific date, um, that it is in fact the full three years or five years or whatever that is, because if, if it just says September and, you, and somebody brings that card to another library, okay, well, is it still valid? I guess it is, it's still September, I guess, but I'm not sure. So let's just remove all doubt and use the specific date, three years or two years or four years, whatever your policy is from the date the card was issued. Um, I have another question. We have several summer campgrounds in town. I have had patrons, also taxpayers who demand a library card because they want to use our digital content that their home libraries don't offer. I cannot practically and politically refuse this patrons a card. You can give people a local use card. You can give anybody you want a local use card. You rock on. Like if your library is able to do that and is able to be generous, that's the best thing ever, isn't it? Like if you could have more patrons using your stuff, go ahead and let them use your stuff but you're gonna set them up as a local use only patron. Um, so that would be the case if somebody said, I live in Fairfield County, that's my home library. I have another home in Litchfield County. Great Litchfield County library can give them a local use only card. That's wonderful. And then they can use those electronic items. 
go ahead and do that. That's a fabulous, inclusive way to do things where you're really removing barriers and providing library access for more people. That's wicked fun. So another question, what about virtual museum passes where the patrons print them? You do need to come up with a solution at your library for how you handle that. If your patrons can, if your library card holders, if your residents can print passes, you need to come up with a solution for how non-residents can get passes. Do they need to come to the library and you'll print them for them? What does that look like? So come up with a solution. There are some options online for what other libraries are doing there. Yes, physical materials include museum passes. They include hotspots. They include Chromebooks and laptops. And everything that you lend out, if you, if you can hold it in your hot little hand, that is a physical item that you're going to lend to non-residents as well as residents. OK, another question in the chat. Can you require people to pick up and return items in person inside the library? as long as that's the policy for everyone. Absolutely, yep, make them bring it back to the desk. And that happens often because your museum passes get lost in the book drop, right? They fall between the cracks and they're gone. So you can tell people, bring it back into the desk. Thank you so much. We can check it off, get it right off your account right away and pass it on to the next person. All right, another question to clarify, if we lend library of items, library of things, items, you can require those to be picked up and returned directly at the owning library. Yes. Yep. There's a bullet point. Yes. Um, yes, you can do that. If you um, have a physical item that is not a print item, so anything other than a book and a magazine, you can require that it be returned to your library instead of to another library. Another question in the chat. Do not think loaning out hotspots to non-resident patrons is equitable. Sounds like the workaround is basically making the reserve function for local patrons, which will make it de facto impossible for non-residents to borrow it since we can't even fulfill the need for our local patrons. And there is always a hold wait list, meaning there is never a hotspot just sitting at the library with no holds on it for a non-resident patron to borrow. Sounds to me like you need to buy more hotspots. Um, that sounds like a really fabulous service that you are offering to your patrons. And it sounds like something worth investing in. Um, but you do need to be aware if you loan items to residents, you got to loan them to non-residents as well. So if it's sitting on the shelf and somebody walks in and they catch it at the right time, they are allowed to borrow that item. Um, that's not a question. If a patron has substantial fines at their home library, do we just ignore, override that and make the checkout? I would, right? They don't have fines at your library and fines are at the other library are their responsibility there. But you may have some agreements within your consortium. I'm not part of a consortium. I don't know what your agreements are. Um, I, I personally would say I would err in the favor of checking it out. Another question, am I aware of the steps Danbury Library is taking to go to digital library cards? I would love to hear more from Danbury Library about how that works um, and how they're lending. Another question in the chat, my library wants to know if the funds used to purchase materials impact lending or is it if we own it, we have to lend it. If you own it, you have to lend it. Yep, if your friends group makes the purchase for us, it is not exempt from having to be loaned. So if you have a physical item that you lend to your patrons, to your residents, regardless of who paid for it and how you got it, you have to lend it to non-residents under the same policies and procedures that you lend to residents. Question in the chat. The monthly CERC stats have a line called interlibrary loans. These are part of our CERCs, but how should these be differentiated from the statistics for ILL? That's a question for another day. I encourage you to send me an email about that. ILL and borrow it are two separate things. So your ILLs will get reported on your annual report to me. They are not borrow it circulations. Question in the chat. If a library near the New York border wants to give New York residents a local use card, is it illegal to charge a fee for it? Um, Don, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in here. I don't know if you have, um, chatted back in response since then. Um, under the borrow it statutes, 
I don't think you can charge a fee. What's your take? So under the borrowed statutes, you can't charge a fee, but it doesn't differentiate a resident of New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, whatever. So, so that's, that's, um, you know, something that we'd have to look further into. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Drop us an email and we can follow up with you by email on that. Um, a question in the chat. I've seen some places limit hotspots and laptops to not brand new cards. Is that legit? They do it for their patrons as well, not just out of towners. So I, I think if you're applying the same policy to everybody, it's legit. Uh, um, to not brand new cards, that's that kind of is a question. So I think I have seen this where a library may say, um, you can borrow this item if you've had a card with us for 30 days. Well, I haven't had a card with you guys for 30 days, but I've had a card with my home library for years. So can I borrow the item or not borrow the item? Um, that sounds iffy to me. I think I would drop the, the residency requirement, the date for being able to borrow things and just say, look, if you wanna come in and borrow this item, you can borrow this item. We have it sitting here. What's the point of it sitting on the shelf? You might as well use it, just borrow it. I've seen places sell a card. Um, you cannot sell an initial card. You can charge people a small fee for a replacement card, but the initial card must be issued free to anybody who requests it. Okay, I think I have um, address everything that I saw in the chat. Thank you all for asking questions. That was very cool. All right. If anybody has any final questions, please do put them in the chat as we wind this up. And as I mentioned, the recording will be available on our DLD web YouTube channel. Um, this link right here, I'm going to update this page um, either this afternoon or tomorrow, like I said, but we'll have the recording available for you. The slides are right here. This is under the regulations tab, so you can find that, but it's all right there. And my contact info is here. It's on every page, right? So if you need to find me, you can find me by email or by phone, follow up with questions. Um, and there's lots of great statements right here on the regulations page. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Really appreciate your time, your attention. Please share this information with your coworkers and make sure that all of the frontline staff are aware of um, what the borrow it rules are and that it's all about sharing resources and letting people use our stuff and being equitable and helping each other out um, and being great library supporters. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, I am going to go ahead and stop our recording and um, let you know.